today is the launch of our Entrepreneurial State 2.0 Festival, which is really the reason that we set up the Institute. In other words, we can't get better policy around climate, around health, around the digital divide with Jen's great book, Recoding America, everyone buy it when it's actually out May 10th, uh, can do unless we rethink the civil service. And for me, the reason I set up the Institute five years ago, so we have two anniversaries, it's the fifth anniversary of uh, the Institute, the 10th anniversary of the book, was that to actually have an entrepreneurial state, we need, new, we need a new curriculum. I think Che Guevara said we need a new man, a new woman, a new human, a new brain. So we can't keep teaching global bureaucrats and the civil service that at best what they can do is fix market failures. What does it look like to really co-create and co-shape a new economy? What does it mean for the new theory behind that in terms of public purpose, public value, market shaping, outcomes orientation? Um, and what does it mean for actually learning in a humble way from the practice on the ground, right? When we actually try to do really great things around digital, around public banking, around outcomes oriented budgeting as academics, we should be a bit humble and then change our way of thinking, given that doing things are actually often much harder than just talking about it. So that kind of, uh, what's it called, the, the trio there of new policy, new thinking, new training, new curriculum is what IPP is about. So we're celebrating this year our fifth anniversary, but also the 10th anniversary of my book, The Entrepreneurial State, which is the reason why I set up the Institute in the first place. And our wonderful comms team have set up a, a great uh, program that ends in June, end of June, with different events, this is the first one, inaugurating uh, the series. And just to say, the different events, first of all, I hope you all have one of those little um, brochures there, the, uh, what are they called, these things? Flyers. Pamphlets, flyers. Um, but we really look at these four different areas, which IPP's new framing around market shaping tries to look at. The first is kind of what is the new directionality of an economy? What does it mean to talk about the direction of growth not just the rate. What does that mean for the outcomes orientation of the policy tools? Second, the organizational capabilities. And tonight, I think we'll be talking a lot about those kind of digital capabilities. How do you govern digital platforms, not as a techie thing, right, but to actually deliver on really difficult challenges? Um, we look a lot at assessment issues. So how do you actually then evaluate these policies? Are we going to stick with you know, net present value and cost benefit analyses? How can we actually assess in a dynamic way dynamic policies that are outcomes oriented, and also how do we actually share both the risks and the rewards? So in IPP, we call this ROAR, R-O-A-R, Roots and Directionality, Organizational Capabilities, Assessment, Evaluation, and Risks and Rewards, and the whole series, which you can see there in the pamphlet, kind of unpicks that at different uh, levels of areas around health, around digital, around climate. So I'm gonna shut up now <laughs> and hand over to David, who we are so happy has joined us recently as a deputy uh, director here at IPP. It's been wonderful, uh, David, to have you for the last six months. He's come from Harvard, we managed to steal him away, and he's moderating tonight's panel, so he'll make a proper introduction to who's here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I don't want to say too, too much because I want to get into the meat. But actually, one thing is, is I'm about to introduce the panel. But I actually think it's nice for the panel to know a little bit about the audience. So maybe just a like quick survey. Raise your hand if you're a student here or at UCL more generally. Right on. Or a student in London. You can say it's a student in London. That works. Uh, raise your hand if you're um, a public servant, like you work in government. There's like a few of you here. Excellent. Yeah. Or have, or have previous, or uh, previous, or want to, or want to is that's good. Um, and if you're faculty, raise your hand if you're faculty. Um, and raise your hand if you're kind of just general citizen interested in this work. Like everybody should raise their hand. I was like, I was like <laughs> you are all citizens. I want to remind you of that. You have more than one hat. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I think the, the the main thing I just want to say to open up this panel, which I'm, I'm so excited about, is. Um, I have the huge privilege of teaching a course on digital government with Mike Bracken here mm -hmm. at the school. And I think one of the things that I actually kind of find frustrating is I actually hate the term digital government. Because when I say the words digital government, people think I'm talking about the future. They're like, oh yeah, you're going to talk about something that's going to impact us tomorrow. Like, so what's the new fancy thing? Whereas anybody I've ever taught, particularly now in executive ed programs, but even my students, when they come to our classroom, they want to, their, their questions and their interrogation of what we're talking about and what we're teaching about is very much about the present. Yeah. We live in a digital era. Our government is already digital. Mm -hmm. 
it is trying to figure out how to deliver better in that era, how to transform itself, how to make it. But that's not a future problem. It is a present state problem. And it's a problem that if we don't get right, I have enormous amount of concerns that people will lose confidence in the state. And that will lead to a place where you know, other types of actors will step in to try to fulfill those services and goods, which I think could be deeply harming to us. So I think this for me is like a, an issue that is deeply, deeply and personally important, I think important to all of us, but it's also not one about like, let's just worry about what's gonna happen tomorrow. This is a current and present challenge. So to kind of interrogate this issue, I'm really excited about our panel. Um, we have a mixture of um, people with a little bit of experience in this, just just a little bit of experience in this domain, um, as well as some people who have been thinking very deeply about this. So immediately coming up first is Mike Bracken. Um, he's faculty here at the IAPP as well, um, but also many know um, one of the original director of the Government Digital Service, uh, kind of one of the groundbreaking um, uh, organizations that really kind of first thought deeply and then engaged in a huge amount of action in helping governments think about how to become digital and be effective in the digital era here in the UK. Um, already introduced, and I think known to everybody, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, really kind of a champion of thinking about like how do we rethink state capacity for uh, challenging kind of the new problems that we all collectively face. And then to her right, uh, Jennifer Balka, another person, an incredible record. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, what to say about Jen, like what has she not done? Um, but uh, uh, founded Code for America, which I, I always thought was like the most amazing thing Code for America did was get us to stop talking about smart cities instead of talking about like who are citizens and how can we serve them better. Like really completely changed the conversation in the United States about what government should be thinking and what they should be doing. Then went and worked at the White House um, and then had, went back to Code for America and has been a thought leader ever since, has a book forthcoming as Mariana mentioned, uh, which we'll ask her about. And then at the very end, Nicoletta, who is a PhD student with us, looking at like what I think is one of the most important issues, which is really thinking about like, how what does digital identity look like? So how how are we going to provision people services in a digital era? If with GPS we know where you are, but we still don't know who you are. And how are we going to tackle that issue in a way that tackles issues of trust and safety and inclusion? So with that said, I think I'd like to first start with Jen because she's just spent the last couple years writing all of her thoughts into a book. And just be like, um, if we live in a digital era, Jen, like, what are, what it, what are the things from your both, um, your, pra your work in practice and your work in practice, what are like the big gaps right now? Like, what has you up at night? What has you worried about where state capacity is right now in a digital era? This <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well, let me just start by saying, you know, if, if, if we did a good job at Code for America of shifting the narrative, it was in large part due to you. Thank you. Uh, and if we did uh, anything to shift the course of the U.S. Uh, state capacity and digital, it was because of this guy. And he did, he has some experience. He did a website once, right? <laughs> Only one. Just the one. Uh, so it's just really exciting to be here, and I've just been such a huge fan of IAP and, and Mariana's for so long, and never been to IAP before, so thank you so much for having me. Um, what keeps me up at night, uh, to get straight to the point, is um, in the, I, I mean this as sort of an example, but the example itself literally keeps me up at night. In the US, we passed uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, you can also say we passed the in, uh, Infrastructure Act and the CHIPS Act. And these are three really important pieces of legislation that are huge. And I think our mental model of how change happens is that you pass legislation and woo, we're done, yay! Uh, in fact, I grew up on something called uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Americans here will know what I'm talking about. The little bill smiles and everyone, everyone celebrates because we pa the bill became law. I'm a law. Um, you know, I think it's never been true that once it passed, everything was done and we could be happy. I think it is less true now in a digital era. And my the thing that keeps me up at night is that the we are not actually implementing the climate provisions of the IRA. And the skills and approaches that are needed to do that are the ones that GDS pioneered, that Code for America works on, that US Digital Service, that all of the, the there are, serve, a lot of this is service design and, um, and, and process redesign and not digitization, taking what we have today and putting it online, but really digital transformation, which is, for example, this is just one tiny little 
part of it. If we're going to draw down the funds that come with IRA, um, that are, allow people, for instance, to get uh, a lot of money to solarize and electrify their homes, which we must do in order to avoid a climate collapse. Um, 30,000 different jurisdictions in the United States have to, str have to permit that solarization electrification at some you know, multiple of what they can currently do that we don't even know. But it's not 10 or 15% better. It's like 10 times faster than we can today. And no digitization of a current process is going to get us to 10 or 10, 20 times better. We actually have to do what people who practice transformation do. Um, and I think there's multiple problems here. One is that our mental model of change is wrong. We don't focus on implementation. Um, we don't see the possibilities in transformation. We look at the problem from the, from the top down. And from if you're sitting in the White House, those problems of permitting in local jurisdictions aren't even visible. So I mean, I, I'm taking that as a very, very narrow slice of a much larger problem. But I think it pulls back to something that Mariana said, which uh, I'll, I'll extrapolate from something she said. What are the capacities and competencies that government needs today? And how are we building them? We're not even asking the right questions. And at least in the US, you know, the consequences of not asking and answering those questions and getting to work are existential threats. Um, you can talk about our CHIPS Act too, which is you know national security and the ability to maintain you know getting computers and phones in the event of additional disruption. But um, you know th there's a lot more to it. But I I think I'll, I'll just start with that. You know um, the you, you said in your introduction that you're concerned that we people will lose confidence in the state. That's the other existential threat. People are already losing confidence in the state. We already have uh, an unstable political order, at least where I live. I won't speak to your situation. Um, in part because people are so frustrated with their experiences with government. We know that when people have negative experience uh, debative experiences with means-tested benefits, they vote at lower rates. Mm -hmm. Our problem in the US is, I will try not to get political, but is our biggest problem is people not voting. It's not people voting for the, I mean, it certainly it's people voting for the wrong party, but <laughs> it is a much bigger problem that people are not voting. And um, I think that is tied very much to your your original question. So. But does the, do, does the average person or the person in power think that the skills that we talk about here are the way to solve that? I think the answer is no, and it should be yes. Um, so maybe you provide us like a great, a, a great American context. Maybe, um, Mike, it might be, nice to he might be nice to hear a little bit of like, you have a lived experience here in the UK and then also have been working with governments around the world. Like maybe kind of talk to us a little bit about how you see kind of Jen's dilemmas and problems relating to the rest of the world and what you're seeing as kind of the gap. Um, <clears throat> yes, thanks David and, and thank you for, for the kind words and the invitation tonight. Um, uh, we, I spend most of my time with governments around the world and um, essentially I'm an optimist. So. Uh, I think there's a, a few things that have come true in the last 10 years, and, and you've seen some of these uh, as well. And the first thing to say is that, you know, the UK is in a certain position, and Jen's written a fantastic book based on, on the US, um, but there's a big world out there. And um, just because you're ahead doesn't mean you're winning, as a wise man said to me once. Uh, what's very, very interesting is where the confluence of political will digital skills and some form of mission or some or crisis is in place, the digital capacity of governments is through the roof. The ability of states to react to crises, to create new services is tremendous. And actually what digital government does, and I don't like the term either, but what this new era does is it allows countries who are perceived to be not at the head of the global race to move very, very quickly. And um, I think there's a, there's a corollary to that. Scale is important. 
the UK is probably at the top end of a nation state that can move in one go with 60, 70 million people. As Ted Lasso said, how many countries are in this country? But you know, you, that's pro probably that's probably um, to begin. You know, once you're into, once you've got sort of the state machinery and so on, it is more complicated and un understand that. But I think for it's not just smaller nations like Estonia, Singapore, otherwise, you know, mid-sized nations now in terms of population size are doing some radically interesting work, and we've seen with, you know, coronavirus response. My favourite story is you know, the response of Togo pretty much way down all the Gini coefficients in terms of how you would measure that country's performance in many areas, its response to COVID was outstanding. Um, now, they've had a few goes at that, but th the point is, with uh, SARS and MERS, but the point is, is that just, you know, digital ca capacity, if deployed with the right political cover and at the centre of governments, not at the periphery of governments, can affect radical change. I'm optimistic for that radical change. I think a couple of other trends that I see Politics lags government substantially. So we are, when I came into the UK government, as an anecdote, I came in, for those who are not in the country, we just had a change of government and the, the first coalition in second in my lifetime, we had, had many, and the, the party that had been in place, the Labour Party had been in place for 13 years, so the new incumbent of politicians had essentially grown up with Facebook and Gmail, walked into government and went, what on earth is this? Right. And what we're now seeing, I think, is we're going to have a next generation of politicians who understand that with, frankly, a vanishingly small number of people with the right digital skills focused at the right issue, they can affect change much, much more quickly than dealing with, often dealing with sort of conventional policy-based approaches. <laughs> now, that's not all good. That's by some means not all good. We've just found that out with Cambridge Analytica in this country and the whole political advertising thing. But I think you're going to see politicians with a more, if not single issue like Brexit, but a more focus on dealing with one or two policy issues, use digital teams to focus on them radically quickly. So I'm quite optimistic about that, although there's got to be some oversight of those politicians. And I think the third, the third thing, and I'd say, and, fi and final thing I'd say, the reason it gives me optimism is, is in this room, but also, you know, we live in a digital generation. The, the, the framing of technology skills has been an enormous problem because in the last 10 years, technology has seen as disruptors, uh, people who want to break things. And yet the people I see around governments are actually the most progressive, reform-oriented, public-minded and public-spirited people you might want to see. That the, We've got to, I think, think of technology and, and digital change differently and allow those people to get on with the very necessary work of reform of government, not see them as disruptors to, to change. Change is inevitable. It's coming one way or, or, or the other. And I think to deny that change is, is a public servant, is to, is to, to not do your job. Uh, and a public service leader, I think to enable that change and focus it on necessary outcomes is, is the game in town. But overall, I'm positive. I guess our two countries probably bring my optimism bias down a little bit, but there we are. Thank you for that. Now, I, um, I would love to give you a chance to kind of just react to Jen, but also as... And my negativity. <laughs> but also, but I think also you're thinking a lot about you're doing your research, but you're kind of in the educational field. You're helping train next generation public servants. As you think about this capacity, I think you might, how are you seeing us teeing that up? Like what, what, what makes you nervous or optimistic about that? Um, okay, so nervous. Um, so I come here as a, as a researcher um, in, by training, uh, an educator by vocation, hopefully, and then also as an activist by choice. And I think some of the things that really come through for me is I see kind of my role in the classroom thinking about how can we make this a space where we think about equity and justice as serious issues around the implementation of digital transformation. And so not looking at justice as something uh, in the words of Mark Dones from the National mm -hmm. Innovation Service, who I used to work with. Uh, justice is not just gonna roll off a hill. Justice is an implementation problem, and I'm interested in looking at that across digital transformation. And so thinking about what does equity look like, not only with respect to maybe outputs and outcomes, but along processes. And um, I think that in terms of in the classroom, 
Um, I'm really excited to talk with students, hear their voices, hear their thoughts, um, but also engage them around critically thinking about these themes. And that's kind of what I try to do in my seminar groups and when meeting with students, and I love it. But I think that what goes on in the classroom doesn't stop there. What goes on in the classroom is an invitation to continue exploring critically what these themes mean in relation to the work that they will do going forward. Yeah. So your PhD yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Can you just say something about that? Yeah. Because looking at data and digital platforms, not as this tech thing, yeah. but everything you look at, I think people should hear what you're doing because it's too cool. Yes, I'd love to. So I'm really interested in looking at how does global governance influence digital transformation in the public sector? And it's specifically, I look at that uh, primarily through global institutions like the World Bank, the UN, um, uh, the WTO, the IMF. And I'm interested in understanding how is it influencing, orienting um, digital transformation in governments through digital identity projects? And what are the implications of that? And so I tried to explore the potential implications of that in terms of how does this influence how digital governments are emerging? And I look at that in Uganda and Kenya specifically. And then the second part is I tried to look at that through um, the Lancet, they had this, um, this proposition where they talked about digital transformation as a determinant of health. And so I'm really interested in understanding what are the implications in how digital transformation is being oriented in the public sector for structural harm and how can we use maybe health determinants as one way of trying to measure and track that and gain insight into that. And so that's what I'm trying to do with my PhD. Yeah, and I'm, I need to do a lot of interviews, so I'd love to connect with all of you, but yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to maybe just just give you an open field to just talk a little bit about React to Jen and the others, but particularly mm -hmm. like kind of like what Jen's been thinking and what she's been trying to think about and, and talk about in this space. Yeah. So I think I mean you have to use. Oh this. God. Okay. <laughs> um, so first of all, can I just say something uh, to introduce? Like. I still remember this amazing walk we did in Hampstead Heath where we were also talking about our personal problems, which don't worry, I will not reveal. Um, <laughs> but you said something which I've never forgotten, which is that those working in government, as good as they might be, we were just talking about it upstairs, yeah. does not dismiss the talent actually, that notwithstanding all these kind of disincentives actually go into government, but you said what struck you when you were working with the treasury, with different parts of government, was this kind of lack of sometimes understanding or appreciation for the machinery, the, you know, the how, the how to do. And that's not a coincidence. What we do in the Institute is to say, instead of embellishing the word design thinking, which somehow is used out there as like a good thing, <laughs> you can also do stupid design thinking. We've designed our way into these failures. It's not a coincidence you have civil servants coming into government that might not necessarily have also been trained in the machinery, in the treasury of money, <laughs> right? Like where does money come from? Um, in health of where actually, all the stuff you talk about in your book, health structures and health, um, care, how it's structured, what do we need to actually deliver an outcomes-oriented health system. Why is that? In, in the Institute, we talk about the fact that we've we framed it with this reactive mode. So by design, you're out of breath. By design, you're in reactive mode. Why? Because you're just always at best fixing market failures. So that means you just need to know how to do bandages. You need to know how to fill the gap. You need to know even worse how to ask others what they need right, which by definition means you're probably gonna get screwed along the way, versus really building a dynamic ecosystem that's outcomes oriented and ask what are the tools, the capabilities, the capacity you need to deliver on that. And what's amazing about Recoding America, which everyone must read, I think it's coming out May 10th, is that- May, June 13th. Oh God, why did I think it was May 10th? Because I said okay. May 10th, <laughs> because I'll get you an early okay. copy then. That's three <laughs> days before my birthday, so now I know my, my birthday <laughs> present is a proper, not the proofs okay, version. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that you tell stories of your experience, but underlying those stories is a really hard critique of why the system is failing. And I think the mix between the stories that you have both collected through your work, working with the administration, but also in Coding for America, and your critique of the system which is failing, the question is what's then 
the feedback between the two, right? Because the storytelling, we can all talk about failures, but then the degree to which it's been, and we were talking upstairs about this isn't about conspiracy, but this is about a structured systemic failure, more than just a nice story there, a failure there, and then maybe scale up the good thing, scale down the bad thing, revealing what these systemic failures are. I think you do an amazing job in actually uh, highlighting your point, which is what it, would it look like if we actually cared about the machinery, but not machinery as a tech fix, right? right? which is, again, why I think you all then resigned from GDS, where it was just seen as, you've done gov.uk, you can go now. Gov.uk, which you guys did, required many different things. The first is, like, citizens are not just clients or customers. They're users with human rights. So the interface that people have when they are accessing their passport, their driver's license, not only has to be user-friendly, but literally citizen person centered. I think you guys had an arrow pointing outside of the window to the people, right? Um, but really combating that kind of, I would say clientelization of people, right, required, requires a really different framing. And I think the, the, the questions that you raise here and what does it mean to have a system which is actually focused on kind of people and planet and delivering on a machinery which is, as you say, not neutral. Now, I mean, what I love about your PhD is that you know, data is not this neutral thing that we just need to then throw at health, right? How we actually frame the health problems, health for all, which we talk about in our WHO Council, then should be informing <laughs> the way we think about the implementation of the technology and that interface with people. Just, I just want to say that this is like an amazing easy read. You will read this, I don't know, how many hours would it take? <laughs> and she has done her voice, her actual voice is on the audio. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that it took her a me, week. Yeah. So not only read it, but listen to her wonderful voice. Um, it, I just think it, cause, it, it forces one to link the stories on the ground, the questions of what are the systemic failures, and the need then to create a different system, which really scales what you often talk about, which is the fact that notwithstanding all of this, you have these amazingly great people, progressives in government, but that really require a different system through which to actually work together. And sorry, what I was trying to say is what you told me was that when you guys did gov.uk, the ideal would have been that it actually changed how government worked, how all the different departments worked together. Instead, the silos, the incumbency effects that each department had on how it currently was working with data and their digital platform was very strong and that there was a resistance to actually allow gov.uk have an all of government approach to deliver for people in a different way. Yeah, although it did, it did do the goal, a lot of that. Um, so let me, I wanna pick up on this, because I feel like in the one way to look at a lot of the way kind of digital has been tackled in government in the last 10 years is kind of like, if we just give people new skills, uh, magic will happen. Like if we just, if we just, if we get more designers in the room, we get kind of modern developers in the room, like things will just happen. And I feel kind of like, uh, there's a lot of public servants who I feel, feel pretty broken because they brought new skills to the, and, and it was helpful, but they still run into this structural change. I kind of almost think it was like, you're doing something new on a train, but the train tracks are still going that way. And you're, you're trying to go this way, but the train tracks are still that way. And it doesn't matter how many skills you have, the train can only go this way. And so there's only so far you can go. So what does, what does leadership mean then? Like what is the leadership, what leadership is required and what needs to change to make things work better? Okay, that's a, that's that's a that's a big meaty question. Um, so, um, first of all, I'd just like to say that I think I don't want to downplay the getting the people with the skills in the room, and it's actually really hard. I mean, a lot of what we deal with in the U.S. is just civil service rules and the hiring stuff. And I mean, I remember my first time in. When I was working in the White House, we were just trying to get a web designer hired into the VA, and we would go find all the great web designers we knew and ask them to apply for this job, and what would come out the other end is SQL admin administrators. Like, it's like, oh wow, the machinery of, of government is something we don't understand at all, and it's not, has anything to do with tech. It's a whole bunch of rules and processes that need to be refactored. There's actually, we went and looked at it later, there's nothing wrong with the law, it's just the way it's been interpreted. and so. That's hard and it does matter a lot. And I don't, I just don't wanna skip over that even though I completely agree with what you said. Um, and I think a base case for change is there are a lot more people in. And 
um, like a lot more people in, even though that that's super hard. Um, I completely agree, however, though, that you get in, yeah, you, I like your metaphor of like, you're trying to go this way and it's going that way. I mean, I, I guess the, the metaphor that I use in my book is that um, we talk about agile develop, like software development versus waterfall software development, which is a fine thing to talk about, but it is not constrained by any means to software development. It, you are in a waterfall. And what you need to be in is a measure build, what is it, build, measure, learn cycle. And yeah, it's like fundamental disconnect, fundamental like, you know, record scratch um, that, ma that makes it hard, uh, you know, to skip to the end. There's three particular places I talk about that I think could change that would help create an environment in which people could use that build, measure, learn cycle, um, hiring, oversight, and funding. We, you know, they, if, if those could be changed to be in a more, you know, um, uh, agile, circular model, it, it would help a lot. Will it actually solve the problem in the same way we thought like, oh, bringing people in will solve the problem. Agile development will solve the problem. Like all these things you do and then they don't solve the problem, you can get a little discouraged, but you know, I end the book on the story of um, a woman, career civil servant in, um, uh, it's, for us, it's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It's a huge, huge part of our federal government that runs Medicare and Medicaid, and um, very, very complex and enormous bureaucracy. This is like, this woman's name is Yudira Sanchez. She is my hero of heroes. Uh, it was her first job ever. She's been there 23 years. She is there for the failure of healthcare.gov, which I'm sorry to be speaking in a very US context again, but it was sort of our big like moment of, of come to Jesus on, on our, our lack of capacity in digital. Through that experience, she was sort of thrown into an agile. She had to operate agilely. There was no choice. <laughs> like we had to get this thing back up. She takes those skills and she, um, um, she ends up building these teams that work very, very well to get outcomes for people. Um, and certainly she brings agile, user-centered, iterative software development in. But what she really does is challenge the orders that she gets from above. So the waterfall that she in, is in is a much bigger waterfall than software development. and. I think in a classic waterfall, you do not look back up and say, yeah, but this is funky. We got to circle back, right? The policy I've been handed is actually not going to get us the outcomes on the ground. Mm. Um, and she starts questioning that and taking the initiative and the, she doesn't ask permission. She just does it to say, well, actually, I think we're going to do it a little bit that way. Uh, in one example, you know, they're, they're, supposed to be dealing with doctors. There's nine different definitions of a group medical practice, like group medical practice as opposed to individuals. She says, we gotta boil that down to two. I mean, they, she just said, what about to one? They get it to two. Mm -hmm. that, that is something, and she has this line, it's actually not her line. It has to make sense to a person. She starts doing things like that. And you know, I kind of end her story with um, her being, she, succeeds wildly in the next um, policy that's handed down after the ACA, which is what uh, spurred healthcare.gov. Um, they get this thing called MACRA. They do it incredibly well. They have such a success that the doctors are writing on these forms. This can't be right. It's too easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, this makes sense to me. I can use this interface. I, I believe in Medicare again. So they have this great success. And then she gets handed down another thing. It's a minor, minor regulation that's asking her team to get um, data for about um, pharmaceuticals, about prescription drugs, out to the community. And the regulation says that they need to do these data extracts that go out quarterly. And she's like, well, this is a terrible idea. I mean, it's going to take nine months to get the data out. It's not real time. 
uh, an application programming interface. It's just basically giving those same people who uh, access to the data in real time through you know, a much better interface, it's going to cost less, it's going to be much better, it's going to be much faster, more sustainable, and the people who want that data are actually going to be able to use that data in a way they wouldn't have been able to. And I just think it's very rare to find a public servant who says, oh, I'm reading what Congress told me to do and I'm ignoring it. I'm not ignoring it. I shouldn't say ignoring it. I am doing what I know they wanted through other means. And that's an empowerment of public servants that is really rare. And it, A, I think we should stop, uh, I, I will put, point this at the elected officials in my country. There is so much hand wringing and so much time spent like calling public servants up for, for tech failures like healthcare.gov or more recently in my own experience we had you know real crises of delivery in covid um, and so everyone gets mad and we focus so much on what goes wrong if we spend an equal amount of time looking at people like Yadira Sanchez and saying what she's doing is the right thing to do even though it is not technically compliant with the letter of the law. She's, she's honoring our intent, in, you know, the intent of the law instead of the, like, let's hold her up and encourage other public servants to be like her. I think we would have far, far better outcomes. Beyond that, why doesn't she have a seat at the table when that legislation is being written? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we asking implementers to help us write policy that is implementable? So I hope that gets to what you're talking about. I mean, she is fundamentally breaking the waterfall through sheer force of will. And she is the kind of person who gives me just enormous hope that this whole system can change. Yeah, I love this story of leadership. I'm curious, like anybody else, like what are the traits of leadership that you're looking for to help build state capacity? Any, any examples or thoughts? I'd love to hear from anyone else in the panel. Well, um, uh, I think that, I, I think Jen's and the book hits on an important point, uh, which is, you know, part of leadership is, is demonstrable leadership. There's many forms of leadership. You need all of them in the public realm. Um, but the sort of, you know, the, the classic uh, idea of a senior uh, leader in this country would be the, you know, the core job is to speak truth to power. So you say, on the one hand, this minister, on the other hand, that minister. That's a difficult job. I was rubbish at it. You know, it, it's, not, it's not easy, and we need that. But it's not the only job, and sometimes it's also not the most important job. The, the, there are different forms of leadership, but I think the two forms that I, I, I don't see enough of is the, um, the leadership that not just delivers, but shows how to do demonstrable change. You, Jen's book, is, 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 uh, the subtitle is, includes how we can do better. And I think part of the job of leaders now, 10, 15 years, roughly, by and large, government started to address digital government as a mechanism of change about 2010, when these things became you know, more popular. So we're over a decade into this now. I think for leaders who are doing this now, it's not just the delivery, and all delivery is, all context is important, country, state level, national, you know, delivery is what it is, is actually to demonstrate, show the homework, how we did this open up, communicate in the open, leave assets available for others to follow. doesn't mean they have to use all of them. I don't think that the leadership that just achieves sometimes quite narrow policy goals or policy delivery is enough. Um, and I think the, the other form of leadership, and this is really hard, this is really hard, and I say this to, you know, we work with private companies and third party sectors and global funders, the hardest thing to do is be as good at consuming as you are at producing. Government, like many big industries, is a producer economy. We make stuff. We like making stuff. We make driving licenses and passports and all these other things. And then when we've done, we go, oh, other people could use that. We'll, we'll chuck it over the wall. And it's like, well, hang on. Why didn't we start looking at what other people had before we started making stuff? And actually putting the hard yards in to consume and visibly consume other people's stuff, whether that be knowledge or whether it be software or whether it be processes and ways of working, that's hard. But in a, in a, in a world where many governments are digitizing and the US and the work Jen has done 
uh, you know, is groundbreaking with Code for America and then with USDS, is what's the effort gone in to opening that up for other governments to use? Like, where are the fast followers? And there's not enough leadership doing that, focusing on the international aspect of that. And I think those, those are the two forms of leadership. I think 10 years ago, that would be a nice to have, frankly. You, we had to fix the websites, right? I think where we are now is, it's like, that's part of the job. I don't really obsess about the word leadership, but more like, again, coming back to the design, what actually attracts people who have choices to come into government. And it's really interesting to look at what happened in the US when they actually had a recovery program after the financial crisis. 800 billion was what they spent back in 2009, and they decided to green it initially. Then the Tea Party kind of you know, screwed things up. But anyway, that was like the plan. 800 billion, we're going to green our economy. In Europe, we're like, austerity, that's the way. And because they had this ambition, you had a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, who was attracted to even work not only in government, but to head up the DOE, the Department of Energy. Would a Nobel Prize winning physicist have agreed to direct the Department of Energy if the idea was, oh, can you come in and de-risk Elon Musk or help us devise carbon taxes? It was about creating a direction, what I would call shaping the economy, co-creating an economy, not just fixing it and de-risking it. So that issue of design was the remit of government matters. Um, the missions, this whole mission-oriented approach that we kind of go on and on about in IPP, that's exciting, right? I mean, if the mission is like zeroing the digital divide so that in the next lockdown when all these kids are at home and you know locked in their homes, they still have equal access to their human right to education, which we failed on globally. Inequality rose for all sorts of reasons, including that. That's exciting. That's going to attract really interesting people who are the geeks in the tech community who are driven to a purpose-oriented government. So this whole idea of what does it mean to create a purpose, problem-solving government that works with other actors in business and civil society to solve really crazy problems that require the welcoming of uncertainty, not fearing it, not outsourcing things to the consulting companies, which Rosie Collington, another wonderful PhD student, and I just wrote a book about. Um, those are the questions we have to ask. So why is it, like what are the structures preventing kind of the expertise and leadership to want to <laughs> work in government, notwithstanding the fact that we have so, so many amazing people in government. And I just think there, there needs to be a lot more thinking about it. Otherwise, we just end up with some answers like, oh, you need to pay civil servants a million dollars, which is what they do in Singapore, and that's why they have such a meritocratic government. Yeah, that's part of the issue. We do need to pay our civil servants better, but creating a problem-oriented, purpose-oriented, mission-oriented type of government that's trying to solve really difficult goals with others, it's never about top-down government, that would be a first place to start if we want to, want to attract leaders. Um, thank, oh, you. Sorry. thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think for, for me, what comes to mind is when thinking about digital leaders in the entrepreneurial state, I think that you know there's a lot that can be done around creating more efficiencies and promoting public value, but I think another aim that is tied to that um, is um, diminishing oppressive systems that exist currently. And so when we think about the state, I think that um, part of what uh, came up in your class, uh, the class that I TA'd for, mm -hmm. is kind of looking at what are some of the historical harms that are becoming embedded into digital systems because of uncritical approaches and what are some of the emergent harms that are appearing around that. And what really animated my thinking around that is uh, the work of Joy Bulamwini, who, uh, she's a data scientist from MIT Media Lab. And she looked at how bias, algorithmic bias, harms, and discrimination became encoded into algorithmic systems. And so I'm like, okay, if we can look at it at the level of technology, what does it mean to look at that at the level of digital transformation processes in the state? And, and so I think that leadership is really not seeing equity and justice as um, um, that we're just gonna pull more people into the room, but fundamentally changing the relationship between the state and its citizens, particularly uh, uh, communities that have been substantially harmed historically. It means that you know trust is not a privilege afforded to all. It means that you might need to take more affirmative steps in order to try and garner that. And I think that part of um, what leadership can bring to that is I think prioritizing these issues is fundamentally important and fundamentally tied to promoting public value, not, not as something that maybe 
it's an add-on, maybe it doesn't happen. Yeah. So I want to open up the, f the floor to questions, and just while I'm giving you a moment or two to think and then to raise your hand, um, I, I think that just to reflect on some of the things that I've heard, kind of just from what I've seen, like one challenge I really worry about is that not necessarily in the United States, but in many countries observe the kind of path the leadership in the public sector is really driven by your policy acumen yeah. and your desire to kind of whisper in the ear of the minister, not in your ability to run a 50,000 person organization and to think about like, what does it take to make that organization operationally effective? And and so that 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 kind of the highlighting of one skill set so dramatically of another, I think sometimes explains why we end up in this trap where we don't actually end up having state capacity because the people who are there really just want to kind of like come up with the perfect answer to a policy problem, not solve the thorny, ongoing, never ending problems of running a 50,000 person organization. Mm -hmm. The other is like, just to speak to yours is, I get really inspired by the leaders who, because, because many leaders then don't have operational experience, they're scared of their users. You know, like, like, sorry, I don't want to, Jen almost lost her drink there. Um, you know, they're like, they'll hide in their office and they'll want to look at dashboards about how people are engaging with government and how they're interfacing with government. And in the digital era, this is an even bigger problem because at least in an analog world, they actually came, like, you were forced to meet users. Like, they came into the office and they, like, filled out a form and then they sat in front of you, maybe behind a pexiglass window, but they were there and you could see who they were and what they were unhappy about. But in the, if they're interfacing with you over a website, you could go your whole career now and never meet a citizen user, like that is a conceivable outcome for you. So, so now like the state capacity in my mind has shifted because a thing that was a byproduct of the animal world now becomes a capacity we have to bit, like intentionally build, yeah. which is why this kind of the, the user design, the service design works so important because it doesn't happen by chance anymore. They, we have to go actively engage. And so we can have leaders who are kind of locked in their offices, scared of their users. They have to get out there not only to build good services, but to think about issues of justice and equity and access. Like that doesn't happen without those things. Um, can I can I tell oh. a quick story on that? I know you want to get to questions. Okay, yeah, well, let's go quick, quick, and then raise your hand so we can start to figure you out. But yes, I'm sorry. No, 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 I no, like sorry. telling stories because um, I think it's I think it speaks to some what Naya was talking about, when, and and certainly. So, um, I start and end almost end with this story about criminal records in the U.S. So we decriminalized marijuana. Uh, I'm going to forget the stat. I think we uh, charged uh, black and brown people at five times higher rate I don't than know, but it it's. Like it could, it's a very realistic. Number. Yeah. So <laughs> when when you charge certain uh, racial and ethnic groups with this, though marijuana use is this essentially the same across these ethnic groups, but we have charged people of color at three or five, I can't remember times, the higher higher rate and, in, and incarcerated them for that. When you decide to um, decriminalize that, you have the opportunity to take those um, felony, rec felony convictions off their record. That is a way that you could make some small amount of justice. Um, there's a long sort of technocratic story though about how in California, which was one of the first states to do this, we passed the law and then we sat back and waited for people to file very long complicated petitions and then file another thing and then wait and get through a year long process that involved 15 different steps and going to the court, which no one did. Um, so in theory, we had made it possible for tens of thousands of people it, well, uh, in the state of California alone, which was quite a high number, to take a criminal uh, f uh, felony conviction off of their record and be able to get housing, be able to drive their kids to the carpool, be able to get a job. In reality, we did zip. Um, in uh, A year into it, um, in San Francisco, 23 people had applied, none of them had gotten through it. So you're missing an, I mean, there's, there's a whole body of work about how digital can can discriminate. This was a, a huge opportunity for um, for it to to sort of to sort of reverse that. Um, and the 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 reason that it changed was essentially that we were we had a team at Code for America that was already look, watching people do this process. Speaking of getting out of the out of the uh, you know in front of people, 
we did this for 7,000 people, watched them try to get through it before we realized this is never going to work. Um, inside government, there was a woman named Christine, uh, uh, Christine Barry de Soto who had, had been a public defender. So she also knew it was never going to work. And she started automatic expungement by simply taking that whole process and trying to do it for them, which also just doesn't scale. Um, uh, we had a woman named Jasmine Latimer, um, black woman, daughter of a cop, who was running the process for us. And I think one of the reasons we were able to crack this nut is we had a woman on the inside and a woman on the outside who already knew this was not going to work. <laughs> and together, they could sort of put out the case that, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why all this paperwork is necessary. It's a record in a database that you could change. <laughs> like. <laughs> So, you know, automatic expungement went from we're trying to like fill out 7,000 applications on behalf of people using very old technology to let's use an algorithm to figure out who's eligible and change the records in the debate database and be done with it. But it would not have happened. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a story of technology. It is not a story of technology. It's a story of two people getting that this wasn't going to work because they had that lived experience. And then they had the operational and technical expertise to do it. But it didn't start with the tech. It started with understanding that. Oh, and can I say one more thing about that? <laughs> I was very quick. Just back to my other point. Those people need to be writing expungement law and policy. Yeah. Sorry, I that's, just, just need to say that. They, get the they, you have to write policy that is implementable because we've had many yeah. uh, decriminalization law and policy written since then that is literally unimplementable. Questions? Uh, yes, you, ma'am. So thank you very much. This was fascinating. Um, uh, I'm Ioana Nula. I, I'm uh, representing the Internet Commission. Uh, I want to agree with Mariana. I, I, I love that you touched the point of education. Uh, and coming from the Institute of Education, I must say that education is under seas. And education is under digital seas. And we are at a point where, um, uh, you know, the idea of reflexivity in education that promotes democratic citizenship is essentially dead. Um, so from a digital policy point of view, uh, we see now that um, regulators mandate um, uh, mechanisms for redress, pathways for redress for citizens and consumers online. And that goes to your point, like how do I communicate with the provider, with the government or the service? And um, we are at a critical moment, I would say, we have an opportunity right now to design those systems that will allow voice. How do we do it and how do we not miss the opportunity? Okay, can I get one other question and we'll come to this? Um, yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> so you talked uh, about low trust in governments at the beginning uh, and a need to recruit better civil servants. So uh, how do you let people to try new things and be innovative in their approach in government while still having accountability, which is incredibly important for public trust? Either one of these, can I interest a panel member? No. I uh, okay, uh, I don't know which one. <laughs> Actually, let's let's put Mike on the spot for how do you get people to well, to try you, new can things. First answer this question because I do feel yeah. like there's a legitimate question here about like how how do you enable the space for public servants to take risks mm -hmm. when the rails are pointed in this way and we're saying they want them to do something new. I mean, I, yeah. I get the sense there's a public servant here is like I'd like to do something new. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I'm constrained. Like, how much should they put themselves on the line? Mm. How much capacity, like, how much space do they really have? And what have you seen work and not work? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitating because it is a pretty hard question. I'm, not that there aren't things that have worked, but um, I can't give a question that takes the risk out of it for public servants. And I'm sorry about that. Um, but it does involve, it does involve, um, I mean, I think, you know, to talk about you, Dear Sanchez, um, I'm like, there's like part of me that's worried that publishing her story is going to get her fired. You didn't ask her? Of course I asked her. <laughs> of course I asked her. We ended up having 
many long conversations about this. Um, I don't think she will uh, get fired in the end, but um, you know, but she's also pretty far along on the journey. I think you're asking about earlier on, like, you know, how do you even create the space in in the first place? Um, you know, the joke is um, uh, that you know, in America, it's just you know, crisis, <laughs> right? Like, you can do things in a crisis that you can't do in normal times. Um, one. Uh, common observation, I think, coming out of COVID is how quickly we have reverted to processes that are um, burdensome and unnecessary that somehow magically disappeared during a crisis. Um, and, you know, so part of the trick is just using those crises and then trying to keep it from reverting. Um, but yeah, we, Mike teased me about this quite a bit when I was at the, that we weren't going to get anywhere until healthcare.gov happened. But you, I think you can also sometimes say create a crisis but um, it's not it's not create it's make visible so one of the stories I tell in the book is uh, about um, we had a we had an application for health care um, uh, for veterans that like just literally didn't work you can read about why like it just if you were inside the building and you had a particular combination of internet outdated Internet Explorer and outdated Adobe Acrobat and settings were such that it would open automatically on your laptop, it opened fine. So if you were a veteran and you called and you're like, this thing doesn't work for me, they'd be like, works fine, no problem. And in fact, when the user researchers discovered that it didn't work well, they went to get it approved and even the bureaucrats like showing them, are like, we can't reopen this. We have a requirements list, and all the requirements were fulfilled. There's no physical, like, there's no bureaucratic way to reopen something that is says it's done. And um, what they did was went out and captured um, audio and screen share, like you know, uh, screencast of a particularly dynamic and articulate veteran trying to do this. And they, in uh, woman that uh, in, in the book who some of you know, Marina Nitza, found a way to get that played, that that audio and and video played in front of the deputy secretary of the VA, and in that moment, everything changed because it went from being, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this paper and all the requirements have been fulfilled to, we are failing veterans and I can see it and I can feel it, and it's not just about the functionality, it's about the emotion. Like they felt a lot of emotion in that moment, shame about what they were doing. And it had not been a crisis. And they made it into a crisis. Can I just address something quickly, just on, on that question, and then we're gonna, not gonna let you off the hook on the education. <laughs> But so one of the things that we work on with different governments is what would it look like to explicitly admit that this is hard? They have to welcome the granularity. It's not this linear thing, input, output, but you're probably gonna screw up along the way. The trial and error and error and error, but investing in your ability to learn from the error. You shouldn't just celebrate the errors, but learn from it, learning by doing. Um, that requires a safe space to sandbox, right? So gov labs, they can, in Chile, they have the Laboratorio de Gobierno. It sounds good because it's in Spanish, it but whatever. Sound yeah. Good. Yeah, it sounds good. So what would it look like if there was, you know, that part of government would be as normal as having a treasury, right? A safe place to kind of mess up and do learning by doing. That depends on, I keep coming back to the design issue, the remit of government. There's no reason to welcome experimentation to say you need to be learning by doing if you're not seen as a knowledge kind of organization, right? Um, and you mentioned, or I can't remember if it was upstairs or here, but in COVID, because we actually saw it as sort of a war, because millions of people were dying, we reinvented, re-elevated up things like the Defense Production Procurement Act, so outcomes-oriented procurement. But it's not this like thing that you just pull off the shelf. You need to, even with that, experiment with it. So one of the things we're doing here in the Institute is working on outcomes-oriented procurement with different levels of government, including Camden, literally the council where we're sitting today. Um, and that can be designed in different ways. Like what does it mean to have outcomes oriented? What is the social value versus public value? What does it mean to not just have the outcome, but to make sure that along the way, the way that you're working with 
other actors is a symbiotic partnership and not a kind of a parasitic one with large monopolies, what you guys did with GDS, which was to expand the ecosystem. What are the new metrics we need to expand or to measure dynamic ecosystem as a result of government policy? You need to admit that that's hard, but have a way to, you know, um, experiment. And the reason that Rosie and I had one of the subtitles of our book on consulting, how consulting has infantilized government, is that when you stop doing and welcoming that experimentation process, you stop learning by doing and you literally stop growing. You yeah. become infantilized, but by design. Um, so I'll just share a little bit about my experience. Um, uh, I was working on a project with a big city government and they were looking at trying to make changes because the system was not serving vulnerable people and quite, it was quite harmful and violent. And so some of the really interesting things that happened is they started building a movement Outside of the outside of the institution, where there were activists networks, there were civil society groups. Um, there were a lot of people coming together to talk about what was happening, talk about the pe fact people were dying and getting harmed, mm -hmm. and trying to create pressure on the outside that could kind of, I guess, shift the the, the maybe the risk. I don't know if it shifts the risk, but it creates enough institutional pressure on the outside that it made the government more willing to act where it had been reluctant to do too much before. And so I think that this kind of speaks to the paper that came from here around this idea of the role of movements around missions and the importance of movements in helping to kind of bring different types of actors together, create different types of external pressure. And, and I think that this is really kind of why it's really important to engage community, to engage actors outside, to think of movements and solidarity as something that can really kind of shift some of maybe the institutional inertia. So I don't know if this is helpful in your case, but I saw it work in this particular scenario. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go next question. Maybe just one quick thing I was at is I do think that my students almost always, many of them come from government and have this frustration. And my experience has been I tell them, I want you to remember that frustration because when the moment you're a leader, you may not have total freedom to do anything, but you always have some, you have some freedom to, to create space for those who work below you to have more freedom and behave differently. So what are you, so now you are living this frustration, you are angry. When you now become the manager, are you gonna create space for the people underneath you to have more freedom than you feel you have right now to do something different? Like that, it can't change everything, but can you create a little bit of space? Um, perfect. Let's go to that. There was a question in the back. Let's go there, and then I got you next. Thank day. you. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I was about to say. Um, yeah. So um, I'd just like to ask the panel. Um, so in order for bureaucracies to operate in the way that you're talking about, a lot of people have to change their behaviours and expectations, including people with lots of powers, sometimes up to and including government ministers. So what are the, from your experience and your experience with governments around the world, what are the most, I mean, effective strategies, methods, arguments that you've marshaled for people to change the way? in which they operate to align with this model that we've been talking about for a decade now. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dan Honig, I'm uh, at the School of Public Policy here at UCL. Um, and I wanted to ask a bit about, you know, you talked about learning and growing and experimenting and, and learning from that. And I guess, so I'm just finishing up a book on mission-driven bureaucrats, and I, I think there are, you know, I think there are incredible, inspiring bureaucrats everywhere, in governments all over the world. And it seems to me that almost all of them have a story about that interface with citizens and that being part of their learning and growth and inspirational process. And I'm worried in the direction you were pointing that, you know, as we digitalize the interface between citizens and bureaucrats, we run the risk of depersonalizing those interactions we run the risk of making it even harder for them to see the communities which are already so marginalized so often by government. And I guess I wonder how we can capture all of the wonderful advantages of digitalization uh, while, while not separating the citizen and the state and um, facilitating, let's say, delivery with rather than simply delivery to those citizens. Thank you. Uh, if you insist. Um, uh, so the question at the back is, I think, was how, what arguments were to make people change? Um, none of them. <laughs> none of them, by and large. 
because if they were going to do that, they would have done. So um, I think that, the, the, I mean, there's a sort of central problem with the framing of the question. It's a very good question. The, the, um, when I arrived in government, basically, a sort of an entire machine was like, right, you're here. Well, now go and write some papers and give us some arguments about why you, who are nothing, should we should all change. I was like, well, thanks for the kind offer, but we're not going to do that because you're not really interested in that. That's just It's actually just a, a sort of intellectual debate that we can have over there. But the, if people are going to change, they need actual change to take them with them. So in a very positive way, I was like, look, I'm not, you know, being funny, you're not all the enemy by any means, but I'm not engaging in an intellectual debate. There are many things about, this was a long time ago, but many things that are like evidently broken, like our... Uh, benefit system and so on. So let's not have an argument about that theory of change. Let's just actually change it. That's why when I first went to the minister of 40 days, he said, what's the strategy of change? I said, the strategy is delivery. That we're just going to deliver at a pace and at to, to a higher level, which demonstrates that the ways of working to deliver that are more attractive than many of the ways of working in place. Now, that sounds incredibly simple, but actually it was a sort of strategy of last resort because you in most governments where there is a sort of uh, a, a, a very strong resistance to change, you either have, you know, the only real way to do it, you have top-down political pressure, which we had, by the way, which is fantastic, or you have a crisis like COVID that's so obvious that things need to change to deliver that. Now, those situations don't come about that often. So I think that, you know, I think, I think making the arguments, the best made sort of after the event, actually, the best man, we said, well, we tried this thing. It's, it's, it had some positive things, maybe some negative things. Let's learn from that and move on. But I think having the, you know, having an argument, my experience in life was having an argument's the wrong word, but having a debate with people about the benefits of using a browser. I am not joking. In 2012, whilst everyone's carrying around one of these, but saying, well, what's the benefits of that? I'm like, well, the answer's look in your pocket. But, you know, it, to some degree, the argument is pointless. It's actually, what people are often saying is have an argument because they don't believe there actually is an ability to change. And I think that's many big institutions, not just governments, have got to that point, is that they're sort of frozen. They just don't know what to move first. And the only way you win that is not, I think, with a debate, but it's, it's when you make the change, be very open about what you've done. And actually, that's hard leadership. Then you also fail a bit and go, well, that didn't work. We'll try something else. So it needs good... It needs, it needs a conversation, but not necessarily an argument about the theory of change, I think. Yeah. I'm going to do use the word strategies, but can you, as, as your famous was saying, strategy is delivery, so I, I should have expected that answer. But sure, yeah. sure. Anyone want to add to any of these questions? I think I understood your question to be about not losing connection to people when you're increasingly uh, interacting through digital means. And, and the labor market back to that. Learning by bureaucratic labor and the services. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that people miss that a core practice and principle of digital transformation is listening to people and in actively going out there and finding the people who have not been heard and listening to them. And in fact, I think the, again, if you think of this as digitalization of current things, I agree, we have a big problem. Mm -hmm. If you think of it as digital transformation and you practice that well, there is, I think, an increased opportunity to hear from people. I, um, this is really funny because this is not my project and I don't know anything about it, but I just listened to uh, a talk that, um, James Stewart, who's one of uh, Mike's colleagues, gave um, about a project that I've been following for years, uh, but not at a deep level, uh, the universal credit. And what he said they did, and you can correct me, um, it just struck a nerve with me. Um, they, what he said was they decided not to finalize the policy until they'd spent a lot of time with a very multidisciplinary team, it included technologists, included user researchers, it included frontline workers, it included policymakers, 
And what they did was basically have people sort of start to interact with this thing. And then the, the key technology was the phone that, that they would call, they would, they would get to a certain point and call. And the point is that they were calling the people, this, these are people who had edge cases, who had complicated lives, who had a lot going on, um, that when they got to a certain point and they had to deal with the complexity, you know, the, the interface was not working for them. Mm -hmm. Very often it doesn't, right? The person they were calling was a policymaker who had to listen to them and explain why this wasn't working for them. And only after several rounds of this did they start to finalize the policy, not the technology, not the interface, not the user interface design, the policy. I have not seen that in the US, and it really spoke to me. But I do think that when we do this right, we are doing much more listening, not less. And I, in a briefly, you know, another lesson from the book is like, um, on healthcare.gov, which everyone talks about. I don't talk about it that extensively in the book, but like, we actually made a mistake. It was sort of an opposite lesson in a certain way there. We tried to include every single edge case from day one. It's very hard to build technology that does that. Um, what we could have done is have a very simple, easy online transaction with people who didn't have any edge cases, it weren't problematic. Like, I'm not sure we really need to listen that much to those people. Is the people on the edges who had immigration status issues, who had you know uh, 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 joint custody of a kid, you know all these things that like make your life really complicated. That we needed to free up the in-person assister centers and the call centers for those people, so that we could get them processed and we could just do that in frankly at the beginning a manual way. But when we would have an opportunity to listen to them. I don't really think we needed to listen to those other folks. They were fine. <laughs> All right. They were getting health care. That was great. And they didn't have it before. Very good thing. But the simpler their lives, the less we need to listen, in my view. So when we create structures that allow us to listen to those who are least listened to, whose lives are most complicated, we do learn. So you might want the two-finger intervention. Yeah, you got to help me out there. Um, I took all day, but I, I think, actually, is a thought about your question. I th I, I learned this the hard way. I made so many mistakes, I haven't got time for this. So I, I learned this the, the hard way, but uh, so I don't mean to be sort of wise to, to your absolute event. The concern about digital generally, digital government abstracting people from government, is uh, uh, turned out to be the biggest false, sort of f f false issue. What abstracts people from government are accountants uh, solicitors, um, all of those people who are intermediaries. And what allows them to occupy that space are terrible services, usually. Sometimes very bad policy, but almost all terrible services. And this is pretty true for most governments. And this is the problem. Politics has a feedback loop. Like every five years, there's one big feedback loop we all participate in, and someone gets voted out. T tonight, there will be people, there will be ideas floated in the press for tomorrow and immediate feedback. There's surveys all the time. Politics is a constant art of feedback loops to find the art of the possible. Government removes feedback loops. And the problem of the machinery of government, the real, the real heart of the, pro the policy dilemma is that the people making policy are abstracted from the policies and the services that they're using. And so if you're writing benefits policy and you don't receive a benefit, by definition, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's not criticism of the person. It's just like you've got to get those feedback loops in. So what yeah. Jen's talking about is, is getting those feedback loops in. I think most, no, not all policy, but a lot of policy should, like the British Civil Service prides itself on writing two-page two memos. That should be the limit of a policy paper. Mm -hmm. A policy paper should say the policy intent. What we're trying to, the universal policy, universal credit policy should have said we're trying to unify four major benefits into one system and that had cross-party agreement. Instead, it was 16 binders or whatever of absolute nonsense, science fiction. In the future it'll be this, in the future it'll be that. So the, the policy should start out thin as intent and then the feedback loops shorten up. Jen's absolutely right. That's, there are so many things not to follow Silicon Valley on. I, the, there are some people in this audience that know about those, but one of the things they got right is that harnessing of those feedback loops to constantly, sh to, to 
to create and then constantly iterate on services. That's why so many of them are so good, annoyingly. And governments could do a lot more of that. Um, I'll be quick. I think that um, in terms of kind of this idea of the voice and things like this, I think it's important to think about diversity and inclusion are important, but also who is in the room and who is making these decisions matter, which is what's coming across. And so I think some of the ways that I've seen people productively think about this is uh, I've been really inspired by Reiner's work around public sector innovation. And so thinking about the importance of diversity and heterogeneity around complex systems in order to create more dynamic feedback loops that can take into account lived experiences better. I think that's one. I think also the work of uh, Joy Bulamwini, and so thinking about how can the public sector think about intersectionality analyses and methodologies around how they try to learn about problems and gain insights and, and being um, really intentional about that. I think that's another uh, thing that can really work well in policy and thinking about what does that mean in practice. Um, and I think that in terms of uh, Adrian, uh, Brown's work around emergent strategy, and so think, she thinks about complexity thinking with regard to social justice. And so thinking about how can we think about social justice around complexity thinking, and, and what does that mean for policy? So what does that mean for who shows up, how we think about power, how power gets reorganized? I think that's also a really, um, a really great thing to look towards and think about what does that mean in terms of policy. And then I think um, the, the, is there any person else? There was another person, but I forgot. Um, but, but what I'm saying is basically there's a lot of really, or oh, David Senge, so David, uh, Dr. David Senge from Sierra Leone, uh, Sierra Leone? Yes, um, he uh, is the Minister of Education and Chief Innovation Officer for the country. And he has this really interesting approach where he's promoting radical inclusion policy. And so thinking about what does inclusion look like across all government processes and as something that we try to uh, intentionally seek out um, and that um, we don't think about just serving the middle, like the hill in the middle, but thinking about what are the extreme cases because in doing that we'll catch a lot of people in between. And so I think these are some really, really productive ways in which people are thinking about voice, thinking about power around diversity and inclusion and really changing uh, not only, um, you know, how, how well are we able to hear people, but who are the people actually in the room making the decisions? How do we think about changing that and transforming that? And so uh, these people really inspire me. I share this with you. Yeah. I, I spent the day yesterday in, I was going to say Barcelona, Barcelona, in Italian we say Barcelona, Barcelona. Anyway, with the mayor at the Colau and her team on their housing mission, housing for all. And we were, you know, talking about the IAPP approach, blah, blah, blah. But what they kind of brought to the table and what we've been writing about also with um, some of our UN colleagues is what would it look like to combine kind of an outcomes, mission-oriented, purpose-oriented, problem-oriented government with a strong framing of human rights, right? Because the human rights declaration is out there, just like the SDGs are out there. We're hardly really implementing them. And what would the human rights approach to a housing for all policy look like? And we have like 20 different bits that should be on the dashboard. So it's not simple, but it's what can actually hold the system accountable. And along the way, if citizens know their human rights, they become part of that. You know, just like we say, DARPA is interesting because they don't know just how to turn the tap on, but also turn it off, right? Agile, flexible, DARPA, but who tells DARPA went to turn the tap off for social problems that we have, like around housing, how to actually use a human rights approach to allow citizens the power to hold the system, even when it is mission-oriented, which might sound good, but actually if it's not you know, taking part of that feedback loop through citizen participation, it's just another pet project but that some minister or some you know, government decided on without. But you need an principles, and, and human rights do provide us that but it's often discussed in a completely different room from those talking about innovation, tech, yeah. and, and data. Um, for me, the, just to bring it back to like, in our course, like one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is that we have a master's of public administration program. So it's not, I, I, policy has an important place to play, but administration, I feel is like this thing has been underplayed in the last 20 years. Like people don't, people think administration is a solved problem. And we just have to get the policy right. And Jen's entire point is that this is not the case. And so in our class, we talk about learners versus planners. And for me, like the learners are the people who are the ops people who are trying to get things done. And the planners are the people up there who are kind of writing the blueprint of what you're supposed to do. And they kind of throw it over the transom and they say, go figure it out. And then the learners are like, none of this works. 
And a huge part of our government has to do with the fact that like there's this line between the learners and the planners. They're seen as different castes. Mm -hmm. And it's the planners who get promoted all too often. And so how do we create how do we create a world where it's the it's not it's there's diversity. Planners are needed, but so are the learners. And how do we create space for them? So Most people I work with say there's no planning, that we need to reinvent planning. There's no long term missile, there's no proper planning anymore. Uh, yeah, I wish I, the national government, I feel like, I feel like I, this also varies. Like at the local level, you got a lot more reaction, a lot more realization that you have to always be adapting, you have to always be learning. But as you get further away from your citizens and as you get as more national government, there you end up with a huge amount of overhead planning process very separated from the users, you know, kind of just, oh, this is the way it's going to be, build it out, 1,600 pages. How do we bring the kind of what's happening at the local level into, this, into the national level and, and rethink the structure? Yeah. So this is interesting, a little in, like insight into how the book was written. I was actually writing this chapter about um, something I learned researching the book uh, about a, a law that was passed in the early 90s um, that tried to get the White House to take digital seriously in, in the 90s. And uh, um, the White House didn't want everything to do with it. They, they pushed back and said, um, this, is, this belongs where we buy pencils and, and cars. In the gen I, I don't mean to denigrate the General Services Administration. They do amazing work on digital now but they are known as America's buyer. They're the procurement shop. Um, please stop, uh, you know, Senator Cohen and, and Representative Klinger who were trying to pass this law, please stop trying to get us to have a federal CIO and a federal CI, CTO. Please stop getting, you know, trying to get us to, to take digital in at the highest levels of government. And I, and I think they simply mistook the digital revolution for this sort of um, new, form of implementation that was just like the old one. Um, but I was writing this, and it, this had occurred to me like, oh my god, that's why I had so much trouble standing up USDS, mm -hmm. is that John Koskinen at the time, in the early 90s, was the deputy director for management at, at OMB, Office of Management Budget, in the White House, said to Senator Cohen, um, that is, uh, we don't want that. It is operational in nature and inconsistent with the policy role of this institution. And I had just learned this, and Mike came to visit, and I told him, and he said, oh yeah, the intellectuals and the mechanicals. They're, that's from the British Civil Service. They're the intellectuals, digital is the mechanicals. They just missed it. They just missed the whole thing. Um, and I, and I, I, I just deeply felt that divide and how destructive that divide is, but they, they really did not see that it was about, as, as Tom Lusmer would say, like meeting the expectations of changing expectations and needs of people. They just thought it was some detail, and so they sort of rejected it. Mm. So, uh, last question. Well, well, we also go online. Oh, sorry. Okay, we'll go. Wait, no, you give one question, we'll go online. Thank you. So, my, my question's about the role of the citizen in terms of digital leadership in the entrepreneurial state. So. I'm thinking about co-creation and participation and Nye's point around voice and activism, but also Mike's point about government needing to be a consumer as well as a producer of services. Mm. And thinking about the examples from the Ukraine where we saw digital services spun up really quickly in response to a crisis by citizens and for citizens. So I guess, so my question to the panel is, what do you see the role of the citizen being in terms of digital leadership in this new entrepreneurial state? Okay. So one is, can digital governance serve as a solution to manage a breakdown of the social contract? And just one more, because they have plenty of them. <laughs> Are our existing and emerging digital technologies contributing to the digital divide or democratizing these spaces? Anyone want to dive in? We actually are almost at time here, so even for these two questions, we only have one or two minutes left. But you can jump in if, if you want to add something you want to add. Um, the answer to digital social contracts is no. I, it can't do that, I don't think. Um, it's a longer debate, but uh, I, I, it can construct a new social contract, but in terms of the breakdown of the social contracts, it can help, but n no digital digitization of an existing government machinery is going to really resolve that. It's essentially a, a political 
uh, issue, I think. Anyone want to think about citizens or? Um, it's, it's not really an answer, but just a reflection. The labor share of global income is at one of the lowest levels it's ever been. The capital share is at one of the highest levels. Why is that? There's, and I won't go into the answer to that because that'll take hours, but there's a lot of what we would call kind of extraction, intermediary, and, and like there's a whole possibility, which is definitely not happening, that something like blockchain, right, which everyone described as taking out the intermediation, actually is creating even more intermediation. So this idea that technology would create a more, you know, uh, uh, kind of less filtered space between different types of actors, what we actually have, and we have a whole uh, grant about this called algorithmic rents, the degree to which the algorithms themselves are currently constructed to facilitate uh, uh, certain types of extraction that instead of it being the feudal landlords is today how we actually govern our digital platforms, that just requires reviving concepts from old political economy that have to do with like rent and even being able to distinguish rents versus profits. Value creation from value extraction requires not technology, but actually knowing how to do the accounting in a very different way, which you know, is, is a big question. Um, I guess I would, I, I, that's a hard question. I, I guess I would briefly say like, change, I mean, as we were talking about earlier, like we have mental models of what we expect government to do, how we expect it to act, um, what we hold it accountable to, and I think those need to change. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, we need to hold it accountable to execution and implementation, not just policy, but there, there's there's a lot, there's, there's certainly um, uh, a lot more to that that we don't, probably don't have time to get into. Barcelona, right? I mean, what they did was through the data commons and, and bringing in hackers into the city government. Yeah. The idea was that actually, you know, you would you would sit, well, first of all, citizens are creating data, but they're not necessarily benefiting from the new knowledge that is being yeah. created from that data creation. So, what we need also in terms of the capacity is that capacity to bring what Ada Colau tried to do, hackers into the city government to give back. Right to improve social transport, um, uh, public housing, the decisions that are being made, but with that feedback of citizens. But that requires a very different type of also knowledge within. The and I think it requires a degree of um, simplification that we are not holding government accountable to now. I just keep coming back to that line from the CMS team where they said it has to make sense to a person. And we're not asking our government to run programs or execute policy in ways that make sense. And that's just the hackers can't, mm -hmm. there's no hacker that can really understand like healthcare policy. And I mean, there's some that do, but they're professionals. Yeah. Like if you're not a professional, it doesn't make sense to you. Why are we not holding our government accountable to doing things that we can understand? Yeah, I, I think the, the I'm gonna wrap us up just cause I wanna really make sure we end on time and like honor the release people and also maybe have people come and talk to our speakers directly. But I think for me, like the thing about digital is that it's actually worth remembering that uh, in a previous era, all your interactions with government were intermediated. They were intermediated by a public servant, often who knew the system and could actually help you navigate that system. And a lot of what we're doing is actually just coming like, no, we're gonna, we're actually just gonna like, we're gonna interface you directly with the machine. And then the expectation is that was gonna be easier or better when actually you pulled out the person who could help you navigate. And so in some ways digital is actually just exposing us to the complexity of the machine. And now people are like, oh my gosh, the machine is very complex. Like how do citizens interface with that? And we thought that in doing this, we could wipe out all those layers of people who are gonna do the interfacing on, on the behalf of citizens. And that it was gonna be cheaper. And I think the two things that I, I would love people to take away from this panel is one is in some ways like the the, the competencies and capacities in the digital era are no different than what we need in a previous era. Um, we just have to have to do more of them and better. And it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to, in some ways, it's going to require um, all the things we previously did and then more on top of that. And so I think often people think that this is going to be a kind of cheaper, easier project. The state will be smaller. I'm not so convinced of that. that there's a real complexity here that can't just be like negotiated away with a website. Um, we have to go, simplify, but also find ways to engage and pull people along in that journey. So that's the first thing. And then the, the second is, is these, if we don't get this right, I have this kind of like broken windows theory of government, which is, you know, if you, like, if you can't deliver someone like a food benefit or a passport 
in a reasonable amount of time, they're not going to trust you to like manage a pipeline or a sewage system or an air traffic control system. And so I think we sometimes people think that these small things that government does doesn't matter, but actually I think that's where the interface of trust, that's where it matters most. And so this huge, it's essential that we get these competencies right, because if we don't, I'm, I'm really worried about what our future holds for us. Um, I'm hoping everybody can say thank you to our panelists for carving out time and sharing such great thoughts.